at 10, Evan. The ongoing search for Crying Child's name has been present since the fourth game and continues to this day. The theory of the name has had many sources, with the latest iteration of the theory naming him Evan. Yet, however, this has yet to be concrete, since the proof of the final letter is shaky at best, and the name Chris just came out of absolutely nowhere and has no canonical source to link itself to. The truth is, we still won't have an official first name for Crying Child. Even in the Freddy Files updated edition, which I feel would have been a good place to name the character, the book still refers to him as the Crying Child. So there's no name for this guy, only an alias. So by the gods, stop saying his name is Evan or Chris or Terrence or whatever in the comments because nothing's been confirmed. Plus there may not even be a way to confirm his name at this point and it may always remain speculation. So how about instead you word it like his name might be Evan since that would actually be a true statement. His name might be anything really, even like Jizz Rocket for all we know. And at 9, FNAF 4. FNAF 4 is one of the weak points when it comes to discerning or decoding the FNAF timeline, which is basically impossible at this point. This game has so much debate about who the characters are, where it takes place, and hell, even when it takes place. Yeah, people were legitimately arguing over the time period of the game, 1983 or 1987. 87 would make partial sense, considering how we see a bite at the end of the game where the crying child dies. And the only other time we hear about a bite in game is the bite of 87, where someone gets their frontal lobe bitten off. However, the television screen showing Fredbear and Friends says that it's only 1983, and you know, the whole skull isn't just the frontal lobe. But this debate was put to rest though when Scott confirmed the previous game's date in sister location. He likes to do this thing where he clears up some things from his last games with the next one. And the biggest debate from FNAF 4 was the year, so he showed us that it was indeed 1983 by using that number as a secret code that unlocked security cameras in sister location that showed us the various locations of the FNAF 4 house, the crying child's bed, the closet in his room, and the plush trap hallway. And at 8, logbook spirits. One of the bigger theories going around is that the survival logbook is possessed by two spirits, one that writes in faded text, and the other that changes things that appear on the pages. I don't think this theory is true, but after MatPat talked about it, it blew up and a lot of people treat it as fact. The the idea came about after someone noticed that in Nights 4 and 5 reviews, some text is altered to say things like, it was for me, I'm scared and I can't see. This theory is a good one, it provides answers, and it seems to point to Crying Child being the other spirit, and this could explain why other parts of the book are messed up, like the page numbers, but other than that, it wouldn't really make sense, unless this book is an allegory for Golden Freddy, but I, it's still nothing other than a theory. There's no actual proof behind this other than speculation and assumptions, so don't take this as absolutely true. And it's seven fan games. There have been multiple instances of people in the comments using points or story elements from FNAF fan games to try to prove my theories wrong. For example, uh, a while ago, a YouTube user commented saying that Vanny's mask appears in a fan game called Aftermath. So my statement of her mask appearing in a DLC to a game that's meant to look back on past tragedies of the franchise, and that could mean that she's from the past, would have been false. Even though Aftermath is a fan game that has no canonicity in the main series. Which I don't understand, because like, why would would you try and use a fan game to prove me wrong? Like, on a video that has nothing to do with that theory, no less. Like, he didn't even comment it on that video. He commented it on another video. Someone else even commented on yet another video where I included fan characters for context, since the main series didn't have 10, where they said fan games don't count, since they're non-canon and are in a different universe. Which was trying to be a dig at me for using fan characters, but since there aren't 10 Springlock victims in the actual FNAF series, in the books, or the games combined, um, I kinda had to. But this only supports my point. If I can't use fan games in a list, which I can because it's my list, uh, you can't use fan games as evidence for a theory, and I don't do that either. And it's 6, Hell vs. Coma. Ultimate Custom Night was a really interesting turning point for the FNAF series. The original Afton storyline was finally at a close, and this game was the ultimate capstone to that, with some important lore hints in the form of voiced lines that play when you get killed, which happens a lot, so that's good. However, this game still fits into the FNAF story, and serves as a link between the original story and the new one. But originally, we interpreted this game all wrong, since we initially thought that William was burning in hell or stuck in purgatory. But as Supernatural fans know, purgatory is just a giant forest where monsters kill each other for all Eternity, not a security guard in an office where you fight off countless animatronics. Honestly, that's my hell though. But this idea, despite being solid with incredible amounts of evidence, was proven wrong thanks to the original final book in the Fazbear Fright series called Bunny Call. Wow, Scott really likes to just 
screw us over, doesn't he? However, in this book, the story of the man in room 1280 tells the true tale of what's going on in this game. Afton is in the hospital, horrifically burned after the FNAF 6 fire, and he is stuck in a coma, much like Crying Child from FNAF 4. Eventually, though, he wakes up, which is him beating 50-20 mode, and is brought to a Fazbear warehouse where he promptly explodes and possesses a hard drive. That's the fact. That the the hell and purgatory, that's a theory. Chat with you in at number five, liability. The spring lock mechanism is probably the most intuitive thing that FNAF's world invented. The ability to move robotic parts out of the way with enough room for a human to fit inside is insane. And while it may be dangerous, uh, we also drive over 100 kilometers an hour in huge giant metal death boxes, so maybe we can't really complain. While yes, they do have their faults, the, there's nothing compared to the ability to be both animatronic and human suit. It's an incredible feat of technology, even if just absolutely the dumbest idea ever. Ah, uh, because it's terrifying uh, for the same reasons that it would be in game. Someone can dress in it and pretend to be a robot, okay? It can clamp down on you in any second, and it has done so multiple times before. The spring lock suits themselves are an occupational hazard that they did not need to end up creating, but like, I don't know, like these things are so hella deadly. Why, why would both William and Henry allow for their employees to wear them? Especially Henry, like goddamn. Just make a separate suit for the animatronic, okay? Like, make a separate suit that your employee can wear. The, the, like the, the, it's the employees, the people who run your business. They make you money, so you know they don't end up dying from robotic bits replacing their, you know, normal human organic bits in a hot suit uh, that fails when it gets moist. You know, sweat, breathing. Yeah, I would never get in one of those things. Even if there hadn't been an incident before, okay, that just seems like a lawsuit waiting to happen. And I don't want to be the one whose family sues because I'm too dead to do it myself, alright? So, no. It, it's a myth that they shouldn't have gotten sued. <laughs> and for Golden Freddy. The idea that Golden Freddy has two souls inside him only started thanks to the bunny called Epilogue, where the spirit of the one possessing Afton went on to possess the Stitch Wraith along with the original spirit. That for some reason caused everyone to believe that Golden Freddy has two souls inside him. However, this is just a theory and not confirmed lore. Lore wise, as far as we know, Freddy only has one soul inside him. This presents an issue because looking at the series through this lens can cause us to move in directions that were never intended if Golden Freddy having two souls is in fact not the case. We have to look at everything from both angles if we're really going to do things properly. Having one viewpoint can end up being our downfall. So whenever I suggest that Golden Freddy has one soul or go off using that idea, it's because it's still a possibility. Nothing has been confirmed by Scott about the two soul theory. Don't take this as confirmed lore. Thank you. Have a nice day. In it too, Mrs. Afton. We know little about Mrs. Afton. We don't even know if there was a Mrs. Afton. We know that William probably had some form of woman in his life, assuming his kids are biological and not adopted, but we also have no idea who this woman was or if she's alive, if she died or if she's just divorced. There are, however, many ideas or rumors that were started by different FNAF parody songs and animations involving car accidents and the Mrs. walking in on whatever William was doing, but none of these have ever been confirmed, so treating them as fact is a major mistake. There is also no official name yet for Mrs. Afton. Some people call her Clara because of Immortal and the Restless, the soap opera from Sister Location. Since there was a vampire in purple that people were comparing to William, which for some reason meant that even though William's name isn't Vlad, that Clara was 100% the name of his wife, which just isn't true. Clara Afton doesn't exist, at least yet. But she has no canon name at the moment, so stop saying in the comments that her name is Clark. It's not Clara, okay? It's not a thing. Stop it. Finally, in at number one, motivation. One question every FNAF fan wants answered is why did William Afton start killing? There are plenty of explanations. None of them, however, are confirmed or canon. They're all theories. Maybe his wife left him. Maybe she was killed in a car accident. Maybe she walked in on William doing a messed up experiment. And maybe William had to deal with her and then got a taste for it. Maybe he just snapped. Maybe Henry drove him to it. Maybe he was abused. Maybe he was bullied. Maybe he's the typical run of the mill psychopath. Maybe he's a f vampire. We don't know. And that's partly what makes him such a great villain. We don't know his starting motivations. Later we learn that he keeps doing things because he wants to live forever, but before discovering Remnant we have no idea what his plan was. It could be the key to unlocking the entire series, but we wouldn't know it. There is the major theory that he starts killing because his children die, and this is just impossible. This cannot be the case, since we know that Elizabeth gets grabbed by Baby, who was one of the first animatronics William made as proven by the FNAF AR Fast Facts. So he would have had to have malintentions before his children went missing, since he had to build, you know, murder bots. 
and those were the cause of their deaths. So, sorry. In 10, the bite of 87. The Bite of 87 is one of the most mysterious moments in the entire FNAF series, and it was introduced in the first game, so we've been dealing with this thing for like nearly 10 years. Being introduced into the series in FNAF 1 from 2014, the Bite of 87 has remained one of the most debated points in FNAF history, and we can't quite agree on what happened. At first, we thought it was Golden Freddy who caused the bite, then Normal Freddy, then Mangle, then Fred Bear, then Toy Chica, then back to Mangle, and everyone has their different opinion on the subject, but for some reason, Reason, people also think that it's confirmed that the Bite of 83 from FNAF 4 is the Bite of 87, which it isn't. And if you look up Bite of 87 on Google, you get pictures of the Bite from FNAF 4, which is in 1983, which is, as I'm sure you can tell, confusing for our editors. <laughs> I'm sure that you're seeing pictures of the incident now, honestly. Like, the Bite of 87 and 83 have been confused for ages, and they're still being confused to this day. Mostly because of Markiplier asking if that was the bite of 87. Honestly, it's kind of frightening based on how many people get mad at me because I go against something Map had said, but then also tell me that I'm wrong that it's the bite of 83, not 87, even though I agree with Map Pet on that point. And at 9, the 2i theory. The 2i theory states that in FNAF 3's bad ending, there are two eyes lit up in the head and the back, which we assume to be Golden Freddy, to show that there are two souls inside the animatronic. This isn't the case, okay, and I'm just gonna tell you why. Firstly, it would be more difficult to tell that it was an animatronic head in the back if there was only one eye lit up, since all we see of this head are the eyes. And the second eye being lit up could very well just be a reflection from the first light, since it's so dark. Notice how Freddy also has light coming out of his other eye, but he doesn't have a second soul. Secondly, Crying Child wasn't introduced into the series yet, not coming until the next game that wasn't even going to happen until the community was disappointed in the Springtrap jump scare. Since this was supposed to be the end of the series, that's why we released the souls in the Happiest Day minigame. Also notice that only one person wears a Golden Freddy mask in that minigame, and according to the official Freddy Files updated edition book, quote, you'll see an image of broken animatronics heads, each with a lit eye meaning that Golden Freddy in the back only has one eye lit. And considering how this is the official guidebook to the series, we kinda need to take it as law. And it ate Sparky the dog. In the early days of the first game's lifespan, someone began to spread rumors online about a hidden sixth animatronic named Sparky the Dog. Sure enough, screenshots began to crop up on Tumblr of this secret animatronic. <laughs> Of course it was Tumblr. Reportedly, Sparky the one-armed dog was a non-violent animatronic and would never attack the player, only appearing occasionally in the backstage doorway, hence why we never saw them. However, it was eventually revealed as a hoax by the creators, Tumblr users Kodai Bear and Nguyen, with all the screenshots being photoshopped. I mean, I mean, I feel like that would have been pretty obvious, but I don't know. Did you ever think that Sparky was real? Like, I didn't even know this was a thing. Like, at this point, my knowledge of FNAF was limited to exactly what Matt Pat said because I was terrified of anything horror related. Um, yeah, like, even the Eddie Brock becoming Venom scene in Spider Man 3 was terrifying. But, um, yeah, I mean, I played it. I played FNAF 1 on, like, the bus home from school, but I did it muted, so I didn't have to deal with the jump scares. Okay? There was a girl sitting next to me. I felt pretty badass. And it's Seven Robot Crying Child. The line, I will put you back together, has been debated for ages, ever since the release of FNAF 4. The line was originally believed to be spoken by William, but later was thought to be psychic friend Fredbear. However, I believe this to still be William, who was making a promise to his son before pulling the plug. He already lost one of his kids to his wickedness, so he won't lose another. He takes him off life support and brings him home, uses his agony to power a new robot and implanting it with memories that will cause him to stay away from the place that did him harm, to keep him away from William's wickedness. He makes this one older though, and makes him think that he killed his younger brother, even if it was by accident. He names him Michael, but later on we learn that that wasn't his true name. At the end of Sister Location, we hear Michael say, I should be dead, but I'm not. And that's not him talking about entered ejecting himself, that's him talking about his past life, as Crying Child. At least, that's part of my theory anyway. I've had a load of different videos discussing this idea, but most recently the video titled We Were Wrong About Golden Freddy has some additional evidence. But as per this list, this is still just the theory. I'm not taking it as actual lore. I'm a man. I can admit it, just presenting it as a possibility, which many commenters don't seem to understand. But then again, they also try to disprove me with other theories, hence why we felt we needed to make this list. And it's 6, Cassidy. 
In my personal opinion, I think the idea that Cassidy is the one you should not have killed is wrong. Okay, here come the comments. I know what's gonna happen. In my head, okay, there is way more evidence for Crying Child being the one you should not have killed. If you're interested in the reasoning for that, to actually see if I may have a point instead of just getting mad right away, please go check out that video. It's linked up in the iCard, either now or later. However, the main reason I believe it's Crying Child, aside from the rest of the evidence, is because William would have been the only one around for Crying Child to possess when he dies in the hospital. Cassidy was around the Golden Freddy animatronic, but unlike unless William brought his work with him to the hospital, which is highly unlikely given the fact that his child's head was crushed in 1983, possibly before Golden Freddy was even created. So reasonably, if Crying Child was going to possess someone, it would end up being William. He would then come to see the horrible acts his father would commit two years later, and then intend on keeping him alive so that he could suffer for them. Since in the end, it was William's fault that Crying Child died since he had super power Fred Bear's jaw, again, which is the only thing that makes sense. It's a mistake not to consider that a possibility, but I can already hear the comments now. Halfway through in at number 5, Assumptions. As the great Slade Wilson once said, Assumption is the mother of all failures. Well, okay, well, he said it while punching a guy, so it was a little more exasperated than that, but still, the point still stands. Assuming makes an ass out of you and me, they say. However, this hasn't stopped fans from assuming more than one thing about the series. Not everything is connected. Not everything makes sense. And assuming that one thing is correct, when it is in fact just a theory, makes things more difficult for everyone. We need to have a realistic mindset when it comes to FNAF and a load of assumptions are made on a regular basis. Especially with the other points I've been bringing up today, most of these are because of assumptions and I'll be honest, I'm guilty of it too. It's human nature, but honestly it's seeping into the comment section as well and people are getting very mad and very mean. It's coming into my DMs too. Since with every theory I make, someone comes up with evidence that is supposed to disprove me, but it relies on a theory or some fact that has never been added to the canon and information. And there are only that, theories or some idea rather than actual evidence. While yes, a diamond is the only thing that can cut a diamond, a theory can't disprove another theory. It just doesn't make sense. And in four, Princess Quest. According to one very adamant viewer during my recent 24 hour livestream, okay, there's a theory going around that Matt had also talked about now that everyone seems to believe, because again, Matt had talked about it, that the princess in Princess Quest is actually meant to be Cassidy. And while I don't agree with this theory, it's still a theory nonetheless, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll give it its little moment here. This theory generates from some apparent files within one of the games, guessing that it would have been security breached since there are three Princess Quest games and that would compared to the FNAF VR mobile version where there's only one, but apparently according to this viewer, those files indicate that the actual name of the character is Cassidy. I don't know how they really indicate that, and I mean like I don't know how anyone found that, they wouldn't really elaborate, they just kept spamming that it was Cassidy, um, despite me saying that I don't care about that because that's clearly not the case in my opinion, because like if you think about it, in the first Princess Quest game, that's when you get trapped by Glitch Trap, right? That's when you get possessed by Glitch Trap, and then you spend the next two games trying to break free. Like, the only reason I'd believe that it's Cassidy is for purely symbolic reasons. Since Cassidy is trying to torture William, at least if they are the one you should not have killed, which again, I don't believe. Which would end up giving her motive to free Vanessa from William's control. But that's the only reasoning that I'd be able to, like, think for this theory which makes it seem more like a hypothesis to me. And again, we get captured by Glitch Trap in the first game, which clearly indicates that it's actually Vanessa. And honestly, this could be what Vanessa's doing in her head. Okay? Like, this is the, when, Van, when Vanny's take it over and Vanessa's not in control, this could be what Vanessa's doing, trying to fight back, okay? Getting close to the end of number three, not beefed up. The fact that these animatronics are incredibly powerful is absolutely an insane thing that nobody really seems to grasp. Like, the fact that Fred Bear was able to crush a child's skull, something that we've covered how crazy is. Imagine if that was an employee, okay? Like, ignoring the fact that you think it's a spring lock incident or that it's a spring lock soup, the amount of power that Jaw has is a hazard for everyone who comes into contact with it. Like, goddamn. And before you say anything, okay, it wasn't a spring lock failure. I don't know how many times I need to go over that. There's no spring locks in the mouth, and they weren't active at the time. 
Okay, it can't be a spring lock failure. So these animatronics are just insanely powerful animatronics, all right? Which would be explained by them being intended to kill, which also explains why it would have the power to crush a crying child's skull. The way I see it, William probably wanted to use the Fredbear suit as his kill suit because, you know, Freddy's the more popular character, uh, but then he had to change to Bonnie after, you know, his son was killed in the suit, especially considering how he saw Elizabeth end up possessing baby, so he was probably worried that Crying Child did the same with Fredbear, so... Yeah, this is, this is, that's the way I see it. Penultimately, into number two, character names. The names of various characters over the years have remained mysterious. Sometimes they don't have a name, other times an alias like the purple guy, or other times they just get random names decided by the community. However, in all of these instances, they don't end up actually being canon. And something I've noticed a lot in the comments is the misuse of names that either have no origin or very weak origins and people believing them to be canon. One of the best examples examples right now is Crying Child and Mrs. Afton. Crying Child currently has two names that are really being used, Evan and Chris, although now there might even be Gregory, which is a whole other can of worms. But none of those names are canon, okay? And only one of them is an actual theory, and not even a strong theory at that. So far, they've only been able to find E, V, and A, and not the N in any solid fashion. And the whole Clara Afton thing is just very outlandish to me. Just because there's a name doesn't mean it belongs to someone, okay? Does that mean that like Crying Child's name is Vlad because the purple character was named Vlad? Or is that William's new name? L like, no, guys, come on. Look, if you're going to apply those rules to Clara, you have to find someone who's named Vlad. Alright, that's just, that's the rules. And finally, in the number one, origins. Going along with the whole we don't know anything about Mrs. Afton thing, or names are being misused, we don't really know why Afton decided to start killing people. And more particularly, kids specifically. He could just be your good old run-of-the-mill psychopath, but some people assume that it's because his kids died. However, that is literally impossible. <laughs> Since his kids died as a direct result of him wanting to kill other kids. Elizabeth dies thanks to getting scooped by baby that was specifically designed for that purpose. And Crying Child died after Elizabeth and as a result of an animatronic with too much bark in that bite. Since like I've been saying in other videos for ages, there were no spring locks that could have failed in the mouth since it was already in suit mode, so all the spring locks had been released, also there'd be no spring locks in the mouth because it's an open mouth. So his children died as a direct result of him wanting to kill kids. <laughs> it could have been that when his wife or baby mama or whatever Mrs. Afton was left him, that what caused him to trigger, but we can't know that for sure. The truth is, we really have nothing to go off of as to reasons why William started killing. Because it wasn't because of possession or his kids. Because he doesn't learn about those until after he starts wanting to kill people, okay? Maybe a Fazbear Frights book will let us know when, like, the twelfth one comes out with all the discarded ones. I don't know. And a ten second times the charm. Could William have suffered a spring lock failure before getting trapped in the spring bonnie suit like we see happen in FNAF 3? In a way, it's possible, and it appears like that's the case in the FNAF novels, since William is described as having scars that are consistent with a spring lock failure before becoming spring trap in the books, so could it have happened in the games? Could William have been the reason the spring lock suits were retired in the first place, since we hear of an unfortunate incident at the sister location, so is that unfortunate incident actually William? There are plenty of other people that it could be as well, uh, but William having to deal with it would certainly get them put out of commission, at least for a time, but with William continuing to use the suits afterwards and putting it on like we hear in FNAF 3 and then again he ends up failing in FNAF 3 as well. It's it, it's unlikely, so no. In a 9 Golden Fredbear. One theory that I've seen plenty of times and I'm sh pretty sure mostly started it around FNAF 4 was that Golden Freddy and Fredbear are the same animatronic, suggesting that the reason Golden Freddy is all limp and lifeless in the original FNAF and FNAF 2 is because his endoskeleton was removed after Crying Child's bite in 1983, and that's why the suit has to teleport around and cause hallucinations because it can't physically move. This would also probably mean that Crying Child would be the one in the Golden Freddy suit. However, we know that this isn't true based on characters being separate in Ultimate Custom Night, although I guess that might not mean much, and just like coloring and size. Since Golden Freddy is much smaller than Fredbear would have to be, since Fredbear would have to accommodate a human plus the robot parts, and Golden Freddy wouldn't, uh, since, you know, 
Golden Freddy would just be an animatronic and not a spring lock suit. But honestly, at this point, the actual design doesn't really seem to matter much, apparently, since Spring Trap went to Scrap Trap and then went to Burn Trap. But from the evidence, it seems like Golden Freddy is merely an illusion or a hallucination created in the mind of Michael Afton. See, our Golden Freddy was never a real video for more info on that, because that proves this idea wrong. And you're all gonna be mad at me, but you know what? That video deserves more love, or at least interaction. In at eight, Elizabeth Afton. I've seen a few people asking if or assuming that Elizabeth Afton was a victim of a spring lock failure. And the truth is, she wasn't. The Circus Baby animatronic isn't a spring lock suit, since a spring lock suit in this case is defined as a suit that contains robotic parts, but uses a special mechanism that when cranked moves those robotic parts to the side so that a person can climb inside and wear the robot like a suit. Uh, the baby animatronic isn't one of those, because there is no way to actually wear this animatronic. Baby is its just a robot, so there is no way that she could have spring locked Elizabeth. Elizabeth is just a normal victim of her father's killing spree, which resulted in her somehow wanting to make him proud, despite him being the reason she's dead. Directly. Like, not even an, oh, uh, he, just because he made the animatronic thing. No. Nobody else had a hand in her death, aside from him. But she still wants to make him proud. I don't know, I guess Baby crushed her body, and then her sanity, too. Which, I mean, I'd understand. <laughs> That's pretty rough. And it's six, unintentional. You see, there are a decent amount of people that for some reason think that these spring lock suits were made with pure intentions by William Afton. This kind of goes hand in hand with the idea that William started killing after losing his kids, but we know that that is not the case. Since thanks to the fast facts found in FNAF AR's files, we know that the Funtime animatronics were some of the first ones ever made. And considering the abilities of Baby, at the very least, we know that these were made in order to kill. We know that that was, that was a, a thought in his brain. Meaning that even if the Springlock animatronics were the very first animatronics ever, it's reasonable to think that they were also designed with death in mind. Which explains multiple things. More on one of them in a minute. But honestly, if William made the fun times with death in mind, it's likely that he did the same with the Springlocks. And if you think that a suit that can snap at a moment's notice and shove pounds of metal bars, cogs, gears, and more into the same place your body would take up, it was made with pure intentions, then you need therapy more than I do, okay? I have some numbers you can call. Especially when a normal animatronic and then a suit for your employees would be cheaper and less likely the focus of a lawsuit. Speaking of which, halfway through in at number five, Mike Trap. This has got to be the most frustrating debate in all of FNAF lore. This debate also arose at the same time as the Purple Guy debate, and they go hand in hand. At the end of Sister Location, the secret ending that is, Mike has a little speech about how he's supposed to be dead, but he isn't, and how he's going to go find his father. This debate comes up because of literally the last two seconds of this scene, where Mike says, I'm going to come find you, and Springtrap pops out of the ruins of Fazbear Fright. This caused some people to believe that Springtrap popping out is Scott's way of saying that they're the same person. However, it was only to show that his dad hasn't kicked the animatronic bucket and that's just you know he's able to be found and that you unplugging his life support didn't do anything because he's being I don't, nah, whatever the whole Mike trap thing was disproven by Scott himself when he said in a post on Steam to take a look at Matt Pack's explanation for the theory which is dumb because you can just say that he's William but also like you generated traffic to his video I mean if you want to give us some of that treatment that'd be nice though um, but yeah Matt Pat also said that spring trap was good old Willie a so there you go. And a poor crying child. Okay, now this one's certainly gonna make people mad, but there's no way that I could do this list without mentioning the greatest debate of literally anyone yelling at me ever. The amount of people who have messaged me on, on Instagram or on, on TikTok yelling at me in my TikTok comments or in the YouTube comments, Telling me that the bite of 83 is somehow a spring lock incident bothers me to my core. I say this every time I bring it up, I, it's not a spring lock failure, okay? The fact that a load of people consider this to be a spring lock failure is the myth that I'm addressing. The reason I don't think it was a spring lock failure is because the Fred, the Fredbear suit was already in animatronic mode, okay? There's no spring locks that could have a chance of failing, since, you know, a spring lock failure refers to the spring lock mechanisms failing to hold the robotic bits away. Meaning that it snaps back into animatronic mode when a person's inside. That's why it's bad if there's a person inside. And there would be no spring lock mechanisms inside the mouth either because that would always be in animatronic mode. Like your, your head, your eyes would line up with the opening of the mouth so that you know, you could see 
So yeah, that's kind of plus I don't think anyone who is seven feet tall Working at Freddy Fazbear's. No, they're in the NBA. The, j and the jaw also just moves up and down, okay? They're like, truthfully, I don't know how much of the community believes this to be a Springlock incident because the comments are always going to be filled with more people that are against it than for it because if you're for it, you don't really feel the need to comment about it. But it's still concerning the amount of comments I'm seeing and the amount of DMs I get on Instagram, okay? Which, by the way, follow me on if you don't hate me because <laughs> I, need to, I need to get past... 20. I get to 19 and it goes back down to get past the, the, the 2 120, you know? Getting close to the end in number three, Mrs. Afton Death. The story of Mrs. Afton, if there even is one, is a mystery that we've been debating for ages. A story that hasn't even had a slight amount of explanation, okay? No references, no mention of an actual name, nothing. So naturally, there are theories about it. However, these theories have no actual base in game lore and instead focus on FNAF animated music videos for the most part and stories that are treated as canon and sometimes scarily heavily so. The truth is, okay, we have no idea what happened to Mrs. Afton currently. We don't know if there even was was a Mrs. Afton, or if it was just a baby mama, or if William had like a surrogate so that he could have his own children and just paid some woman to have his kid. Hell, okay, these, these kids may just be adopted for all we know. Either way, for some reason, and I don't know what video really caused this to pick up, a load of people think that Mrs. Afton died in a car accident and then is now possessing Ballora. I mean, it's a possibility, certainly, but that doesn't mean that it's canon. This is still a problem to this day, with many people just a couple of days ago trying to tell me what happened, mostly treating their statements as fact. A couple examples, if I may. Quote, William killed Mrs. Afton. He stuffed her body into Ballora. Or, William Afton killed Mrs. Afton, and Mrs. Afton now is Ballora in sister location. And, Mrs. Afton is Ballora now, though. That last one was meant to be a fact. Like, there is no interpreting it otherwise. They intended that on being, like, a correction. All of these are equally possible, okay? But nothing is actually canon. And as far as we know for certain, Baby is the only possessed sister location animatronic. And I think that the fact that there's so much fighting against what actually happened to Mrs. Afton indicates that none of this is true. The other animatronics may have like the remnant in them from the original missing children robots, but that's it. A Ballora themed staff robot being present at a table in security breach only means that Ballora was meant to represent the mother, not that she possesses the animatronic. Are we saying that like William is possessed? the staff bot and so is crying child and yeah no we're not so like she's not possessing Ballora that's not a thing Ballora isn't possessed but ultimately in number two spring locks are real okay you see if I was to actually do like a cosplay of the purple guy and, and actually do it without it being a joke I'd probably end up using a purple phone case because you know you gotta reference the phone guy but I don't need a spring lock crank because those aren't actually a thing in real life while the term spring lock is used in real life it is a totally different mechanism from the actual FNAF thing, okay? I'm certain most of you got the whole spring locks are real line from the spring locks in you how not to die remastered thread on the FNAF wiki. However, actual spring locks are just locks that use springs. From my research, what I gathered was that a spring lock in real life is is in the simplest of terms if your front door's deadbolt was on a spring. Every other instance talking about real spring locks just simply brings you back to that page or quotes that page, so there's really only one source. Spring locks, as they're used in the games, do not exist in real life. All right, that is a myth. The term is used, but it's it's being it's two separate words instead of one, and they mean totally different things. So please stop. In six fan games, there have been multiple instances of people in the comments using points or story elements from FNAF fan games to try to prove my theories wrong. For example, a YouTube user commented on another video saying that Vanny's mask appears in the FNAF fan game called Aftermath. So my statement that her mask appears in the DLC to a game that's meant to look back on the past tragedies of the franchise and that could mean she's from the past is false. Even though Aftermath is a FNAF fan game and has no canonicity in the main series. Which I don't understand because like why would you use a fan game to try to prove me wrong? No, a video that has nothing to do with that Vanny theory, no less. Someone else even commented on yet another video where I included fan characters for context since the main series didn't have 10, where they said fan games don't count since they're non-canon and are in a different universe. Which was trying to be a dig at me for using fan characters, but I mean like there aren't 10 Springlock victims in the main series, in the books or the games combined. But 
but this only supports my point that you can't use fan games as evidence for a theory. But you can use them on a list if need be, all right? And it's seven, Kelsey. The new kid from 1.35 AM is a story from 3rd Fast Bear Frights book. The story revolves around Devin, Mick, and Kelsey. Devin and Mick are outcasts, they, and they aren't really popular, you know, they aren't cool. But when the new kid Kelsey arrives at their school, they try to make a new friend. Despite Kelsey being charismatic and adored by everyone in the school, over time Devin grows jealous of Kelsey, because, you know, he's adored and loved by everyone in the school. So in an act of revenge, or to maybe try to gain control over him, Devin hatches a plan to lure Kelsey to an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's to trap him in a springlock suit for a few hours. I guess to try to humble him, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why you thought that this would be a good thing, but obviously the plan goes horribly wrong because it's a FNAF book. After getting in the suit, the springlocks ended up failing, as expected, because it's a FNAF book, causing all of the blood to soak into the fur of the animatronic and pull around the ground. Devin and Mick leave Kelsey for dead so that they won't get in trouble, but then something doesn't feel right. So a week later, Devin returns to the scene of the crime to make sure Kelsey's body is still there. He sticks his hand in the animatronic's mouth because he doesn't think about fingerprints and snap. The spring locks fail yet again, as per usual, and Devin gets his hand stuck inside the suit and bleeds out. But not before seeing a body in the suit with black hair instead of Kelsey's blonde hair. I don't know, okay? Could this be a character that we have yet to see in the games? Probably not. It's just the character in the book, all right? This, this, this doesn't happen in the games, okay? It's a myth. This is just a book thing, okay? Stop. Halfway through in at number five, Dead Afton. Okay, here we go again. There's gonna be so many mad comments on this video. William Afton didn't die in the spring locking incident that we see in FNAF 3's 8-bit minigames, okay? He didn't. I know there are still plenty of people who think that he did die, but he didn't. MatPat even said it himself. Since the majority of people who are saying this are also the ones who say I'm wrong because MatPat said whatever, okay? He said in one of his FNAF 3 or 4 timeline theories or something that to note that you don't see William die in the suit. Okay, you see him convulsing because of the spring locking and then twitching, but he never stops moving. And thanks to the man in room 1280, we know that William was being kept alive by the spirit of one of his victims that the book calls Andrew, but the game's called the one you should not have killed. And we know that these are meant to help fill in blanks from the past, thanks to a Reddit post from Scott from 2020 saying, let me at least say this, future games will look forward, but the novels will fill in some blanks from the past. So this book single-handedly gives us a reason as to how William survived all those years other than Remnant, okay? The one you should not have killed was possessing him, and might still be. We don't know. Getting close to the end in number three, Gravestones. The gravestone ending and the positions of the FNAF 3 heads are what we base the missing children's names on, each with a head lining up with one grave, with the girls being in line with Chica, the girl character. But despite this, it's still a theory. It is absolutely a solid theory, but to my knowledge, Scott hasn't confirmed this naming to be absolutely true in any written post. Even more theoretically are the names of Charlotte and Cassidy, which we believe to be on the other two graves, where the names aren't actually visible. Charlotte being the one on the hill thanks to her looking over the missing children, as well as the location of her grave in the novels, and Cassidy because it seems to have been Golden Freddy's name as revealed by the logbook. But honestly, since we can't see the names, we still don't know if this is true. It could be revealed that these names we've never even seen before are on those graves. The one on the hill could be Elizabeth, and the one behind the grass could actually be Crying Child's name. Hell, it could have actually just been a kid who was named Grass, or Audio Science, as MatPat suggests in a theory on the subject. Until we get a written post by Scott or whoever takes over next, unfortunately, it's still just a theory, despite being a theory that is widely accepted as canon because of the magnitudes of evidence. Don't get me wrong, I think that it's true, I'm just saying that it's not confirmed. Finally, in a number one, singular mindset. The biggest mistake that we can make when talking about FNAF lore is having a singular mindset. One way of viewing things and then completely disregarding something if it doesn't align with those beliefs. I mean, the same remains true for life, however it's especially a problem with FNAF. I get it, okay? Matt Pat was here first and you've been theorizing with him for years. But the thing is, and, and he says it himself, that's just a theory. And that doesn't discount other theories from being possible and even right. Matt, Pat, and others have been wrong before. So when I or anyone else suggests something that's against the grain, it's still possible. Like in the case of Crying Child being the one you should not have killed. I am 100% convinced that I am right on that. 
I provided solid evidence and reasoning, but for some reason people seem to disregard it because it's not normal. It's against the grain. It's not what MatPat said. I even see comments that say, but MatPat said this, so you're wrong, or no, you're wrong because MatPat said that. And my point to that is, is literally, it's just a theory. He says it at the end of every video, every single time, for this reason. Open your brain to new possibilities, bruh, because it's the only way we'll actually get answers. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. So if we keep using the same theories over and over and expect to solve something new, it's not gonna happen. Just open your mind.